It's my great pleasure to welcome Nuno Lopez to the workshop. Uh, Nuno has been doing great work over the years in uh, correctness of systems in general, like verifying systems and just generally uh, ensuring that they work reliably. So I know a lot of his work from the networking space when he was at Microsoft Research before moving to uh, University of Lisbon. And it was really great work. Uh, but today he will talk about verification of LLVM. So uh, really looking forward to the talk. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, so t today I'll go over, you know, some some stories of uh, on, on the last decade of us, you know, verifying or trying to verify LLVM and um, how we managed to get these tools adopted, why they were not adopted. Um, Sorry, I guess we should use. Could you use the microphone? Okay. I, I don't know. This is doing what it's doing. Hello. Okay, it works. Yeah, and so, you know some interesting stories on you know what took to get these tools adopted because you know it's not always easy to get uh, adoption. Okay, so what's LVM? So LVM is probably in your pocket right now, so it's used by everyone. You know, um, I probably have forgot a bunch of companies, but it's in everyone's pockets these days. Uh, it is across a lot of different languages. Some may be surprising for you because it goes anywhere from C to things like TensorFlow and PyTorch and also DirectX, for example. So it's used across a big spectrum of languages. Okay, and this is a compiler for you, uh, 101. So, and LVM is a typical compiler, right? So it, we have these front ends that produce some IR, and all front ends produce exactly the same format, right? And then we have these optimizers that read and write this very same IR. And then finally, we have the back end, which will just produce some um, assembly, right? So pretty much all compilers look like this. I guess the exception is MLIR, um, but besides that, everyone looks like this. Okay. so. LVM has what we call the SSA-based intermediate representation. So let me just give you a brief uh, introduction. So this IR is functional in the sense that each variable can only be written once. And so the question is what happens when in the program you assign more than once to a variable, like here. So here we assign to be twice. So let's look how LVM represents it internally. Uh, so the IR is close to assembly, let's say. So here we do the comparison and say, is cond not zero? If so, we, we go to the then branch. We do the addition and we store the result to variable b1, not b, right? And in the else branch, we store to b2. So you see in the two branches, we store two different variables because we can only store once. So now we need some magic um, to merge the two, right? When we uh, go to end, and this magic is called phi, so there's this phi node that takes multiple arguments and says, if my predecessor is a then block, then the result is b1. If my predecessor is else, then I give b2. And that's the magic you know, to, um, to, to merge multiple definitions of the same variable. Okay? And this is how LVM sees programs. And so this intermediate representation is the most important data structure in a compiler and probably in the world, right? Because co co compilers are very important. Um, because, you know, everything touches this IR. So all optimizations read and write this thing. So, um, you know, it's, it's used by millions of lines of code. So it's, it's, it's a very important, right? So there are a lot of responsibilities that this IR should have. Right? When, for example, it should be expressible. Expressible not in the sense that it's too incomplete so I can write stuff there, but expressing in the sense that I can lower efficiently, you know, uh, whatever source language into this IR, right? We should support the optimizations that we care about, and we'll see that that's not always the case. And it should, hopefully, block transformations that are wrong. For example, SSA blocks a category of transformations that we say are wrong, so it's, it's a good thing. It should also be um, allow for efficient transformations and analysis. So for every analysis, there is like an optimal IR that makes that analysis even O1, right? Or O N. 
Um, and so SSA, for example, makes certain analyses constant. Other analyses are like linear, and some analyses are like almost impossible. Um, so, you know, we would like the analysis that we care about to be efficient. And then, you know, front end should be able to communicate with the optimizers. Like, uh, for example, safe languages know a lot about the programs. Like, they cannot uh, read memory out of bounds and this and that. So, and they should be able to communicate with the optimizer. Look, I know these cases will never happen. And you should be able to cache stuff. So if you infer something, you better just infer it once because you know, it's expensive. And then, of course, in the end, we want assembly. So we should be able to just get assembly. And so what this is IR, you know, of course, it doesn't exist. Right? So uh, we need kind of a trade-off between all of these things. LVM IR is one point in the design space you know, that compromises along this. Right? But what we'll show is that actually it was a bad <laughs> Uh, point in this de design space. Okay, so why do we focus on compilers? There are so many things that you can verify. Why focus here? And no, I mean, I'm a bit biased because I like compilers, but uh, but a point is that they are super important, right? Every single program in the world goes through a compiler, and these days it usually goes through more than one compiler. So all applications go through the compiler. The operating system goes through the compiler. The compiler is compiled using a compiler. Even the hardware today, a lot of it is compiled through a compiler. So without compilers, there's no computers, right? So we really want compilers to be good. The second question is about motivation. It's like, are, do compilers have bugs or you know, are just doing a theoretical exercise? And well, I think you can ask Sendon. Uh, knows better than me, but there are many papers out there uh, saying yes, there are bugs in compilers. So this is a very small selection. I, I just took a random selection of papers, but these tools have been finding literally thousands of bugs in compilers. So of course compilers have bugs. I mean, it's they have millions of, of lines of code, and like any program of that size has you know infinite number of bugs. So these bugs exist. And the last reasonable question to ask is, do we care? And the, and the question is yes. So compiler bugs can actually be pretty bad. So this is not a well-studied thing, but um, compiler bugs can equal security vulnerabilities. right? So it, this is not very well documented because people can hide it under the, in the rug. But you know, it has been sufficient for academics to actually pull out a, um, an attack and manage to compile sudo with a broken LVM and allow everyone to get root access because of the compiler bug. Right? So you know, compiler bugs can be quite, quite bad. And the other thing is you can do whatever proofs you want at source level, right? but if the compiler is broken, like no guarantees about the assembly. Right? Um, so we need to make sure that the compiler is OK. Right? OK, so so far, I hope I convince you that compilers is the most important thing in the world. And uh, they have bugs. And these bugs can be quite bad. And since the IR is so complicated to de de design, you know, of course, they are all, all the IRs out there are not really good. Uh, and so let's see what we can do. OK, so let me just show an example to see. You know, maybe you, yes? Ah, yes, Comsert comes to mind, yes. Um, so Comsert is a verified compiler, right? So it was built from scratch with that idea. Um, the deal with Comsert is twofold. First, it doesn't have many optimizations, right? So it's a kind of simplified compiler. It doesn't even support the whole spec of C. So if you want to implement like system-like code, some of it will not work there. And, um, and, and, and Comsert, even the theory behind Comsert is, com is not complete yet. So there are some holes in the theory of Comsert. For example, when the program reaches, um, um, so when the program goes out of memory, Comsert doesn't give you any guarantee. Right? So it may be a theoretical concern, right? Because usually you don't go out of memory, but the problem is still there. So we still don't know how to write 
specifications for compilers that are actually really tight and good, right? So concert is still not the final answer. As well, this work is not the final answer, so we are still kind of working towards there. So I guess Comcert is going in one direction of trying to make sound compilers by construction good, and we, I'm trying to go on the other direction, which is trying to get these in the, in industrial compilers good. So eventually, I hope we can meet in the middle, um, but we are still a bit far from, from that middle, um, I guess. Okay, so uh, maybe you are thinking, uh, why do these, all these developers are getting optimizations wrong? Let me j just show you how actually easy it is and why you know, everyone does these mistakes all the time. So this is a very simple transformation. So the idea is that if C and D are constants, um, the optimized program will do just one division. So we'll save a shift, okay? Because you'll do the shift um, at compile time. So if we use our school algebra, so on the left we are computing that expression, on the right we have this one, but if we massage it a bit, we get exactly the same expression. Right? So it seems like this transformation is correct, we hope. But if we run this transformation through one of our tools, it will tell you, well, actually the transformation is wrong because it's possible that this t will become zero and so you will introduce a division by zero, right? And the original program will not divide by zero. And this happens because of overflows, right? And, and in fact, this was a bug in LLVM and actually in another compiler. So it shows that even developers, like compiler developers that are used to reason about overflows in their day job, they also get these things wrong because it's very easy to forget of one crazy overflow, right? So, um, so, so it's super easy to introduce this box. Okay. All right, so what, what does it mean to have a correct compiler? So it means a lot of things. One is we need to be able to lower you know, the source language into some IR, and this IR should have similar semantics to the, to the source code. It's not equivalent because uh, source languages often have unspecified behavior, undefined behavior, whatever implementation defined behavior, right? So we can get rid of these things. And, um, and so it's not necessarily equivalent, it's just, you know, something similar, okay? And the same for optimization. So uh, intermediate representations also have a lot of unspecified behavior. So you can remove behavior, which means that the program would be not necessarily equivalent, right? And finally, the same. So when we go to assembly, we can also remove certain behaviors, okay? So, and if you do all these proofs, then you have a refinement between source and, and assembly, and, and you're fine, right? And so in our work, we focus here in the middle for maybe two reasons. One is it's very convenient because the input and output of all optimizations is all the same. So it's, you don't need 100 different specifications, right? It's just one. And second, this part is usually the biggest in the compiler and the one with more complicated algorithms and where usually like half of the bugs are. Okay. This part here is not super complicated technically, but it's also a bit buggy, but then you need a spec for every uh, chip, right? So it's, it's, it's less practical, let's say. So we focus on that middle. Okay. So our first attempt was this tool, we had this website, uh, we had this tool called Alive, and essentially it was you know, fully aut automatic tool. We had this DSL, so you could write your optimizations in this DSL. So the DSL is very, well, it's almost the same as the LVM IR, so the learning curve for LVM developers was pretty low. What they had to learn was to put this error here, so it was very easy, learning curve, um, and then you click on play button and it will say, okay, it's correct, it's not correct, whatever. Um, and it found quite a, a few dozens of bugs. And, um, and yeah, so, and it was used by uh, a bunch of companies. So now, let me give you an interesting story, which was how we managed to get the live adopted, right? Because getting verification tools adopted is usually like, it, it's really hard, right? Because sell, selling correctness is, is like, 
it's impossible, right? So what I did was, you know, I had this tool and I was on the LVM mailing list waiting for patches to come in because, like, we could not verify all of the LVM optimizations with this tool, so only a very small subset. So I was on the mailing list waiting for the right patch to come that, you know, something that we could verify. And fortunately, like, like a few weeks later, there was this amazing patch which gave like a 4% speed up on one of the spec benchmarks. Like getting a 4% speed up on spec is almost impossible. Like there was once a, a, a developer that told me that the life of a compiler engineer is to get a 2% speed up on spec. And this guy was getting 4% speed up. So he was worth you know, two developers. Um, <laughs> so you know, very important patch. It was only 40 lines of code, so what could go wrong, right? Um, so uh, what I did was I took this C++ code and I uh, translated it into the Alive DSL and tried to prove that it was correct. Luckily, it was wrong, because uh, <laughs> we live off these, these things, right? Um, and so the patch was basically simplifying a bounce check, right? And so imagine now that what was happening was um, it was changing the bounce check condition, right? So this, this was a potential security vulnerability because it was removing a bounce check from the program that it should be there, right? So the patch was wrong. And so I sent him an email with this thing. Look, your patch is wrong. And then he sent another patch that was still wrong and so on. And there was some interaction until we finally uh, we got some correct patch, right? And see now the precondition uh, is kind of crazy, right? So I challenge any of you to go home and try to prove that this, con this precondition is, uh, is sufficient, you know, to, to make this optimi optimization correct, right? It's not easy. Uh, but the good thing is that it was still firing on the benchmarks, right, which was the important thing. Uh, and we managed to avoid, you know, potential security vulnerability, right? And this was great uh, because the fact that many of the patches were wrong, actually this played good for, you know, we, it was good for us, right? Because people noticed that there was this developer from this, you know, top company struggling to get the patch correct. And, you know, there was this tool that was feeding him with examples. Oh, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And so people took notice and then that's how they started to ask us, you know, is your tool available? Can we use it? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And actually, a funny story, this is why also Z3 was made open source. <laughs> but that's a long, longer story. Um, because Z3 was not open source, um, or it was available through a, um, a paid license uh, at that time. And then it became open source um, afterwards. Anyway, but just say that I think here the, the story is that, you know, let's. Um, we did a bunch of examples. Like this was not the only case. Like we continue to, uh, to, to, to do this, and this served as well as marketing as education, right? Because people were seeing how you can do this, how it's not that complicated, and and showing the value, right? Because debugging a miscompilation of a compiler is a nightmare, right? Like you cannot imagine uh, how, for example, the Windows team did they get usually on, on average two blue screens per year caused by the compiler. So now, can you imagine how can you debug, like you are booting Windows and then it crashes, how the heck do you find out the optimization that screw up you know, the boot process, right? It, it's, it, <laughs> it's not easy, right? So if you have this tool that you know, takes five minutes to use, then of course people are gonna use it. Okay. Um, but eventually we hit this problem is that we were running this tool across a bunch of optimizations, but it was saying that a lot of these optimizations were wrong. And we would ask around the developers, you know, is this wrong, is this right? And like, no one could tell us. Or different people would have different opinions whether the optimization was correct or not. So what do we do? First you cry, and then uh, you start digging, right? Uh, because like, I wanted to know whether this is correct or not. Um, so we start studying this undefined behavior. So all of these issues were about undefined behavior. Like it was a very poorly studied 
concept. Like people are like, oh, this is like dragons, whatever. Uh, but I cannot, you know, uh, put a dragon in a SMT silver. So uh, we we needed to know exactly what it means. So we made this study, and one fun thing that we proved is that LVMIR was not expressive enough. Right? So people wanted to do certain optimizations, like two classes of optimizations, and we proved that you had to choose one of those. And funny thing is that LVM was doing both. And this cannot be good, right? Because we proved that you cannot do both, and LVM was doing both. So this means that you are exposed to miscompiling code. And so we proposed a fix, which was a new instruction. Um, yeah. um, okay, L let me just give you a quick introduction to undefined behavior because it's not something that um, is well known. So LVM has three undefined behaviors, okay? One is the, what you call the immediate undefined behavior, which is used for things that will crash the CPU when executed. So it's something, for example, that you cannot hoist out of a loop because if you execute ahead of time, it may crash the CPU, so you don't want to do that, right? Like division by zero, accessing memory that you are not supposed to access, things like that. Then it has this undef value, which is an arbitrary value, but that can return different values every time you, you read it, okay? Which is quite nasty. Um, and then it has this poison which is like, a, I don't know if you know the floating point NANs. So it propagates throughout the expression tree. And um, so every operation with poison is poison. Uh, so by the way, these things are super useful. Um, this, they are not nasty or dragons or whatever. Like this is super useful to communicate stuff with the optimizer, okay? It's not like th these are not concepts for the users to see. These are concepts just for the optimizer, for the compiler to, to work with, okay? Um, you know, I think before our work, no one had like system, systematically studied these things to know exactly what they mean and what, what you know, how they interact with the optimizers. Um, anyway. Let me just quickly show you. So we say that GVN and loop and switch cannot be together in LVN. So what loop and switch does is, if we have a loop with a branch inside, and the condition is loop invariant, which means it will always in you know, evaluate to the same um, to the same branch on every iteration, then we can hoist the the branch outside of the loop, right? So you can basically duplicate the loop and then do the branch before. So this comes at a small code size increase, but at least you don't branch inside the um, the, the loop. Okay. For this optimization to be correct, um, branch on poison or undef cannot be undefined behavior. Because imagine that C was false, right? Now you are going to run C2, and on the original program you were not running C2, right? So you cannot introduce undefined behavior, right? So we, we need to make sure that switching the, the order of evaluation is okay, okay? And this means branch on poison cannot be UB. That's the, the conclusion. So let's look at GVN now or global value numbering. So the idea is we want to f compute equivalence classes between values, and then we pick one representative. In this program, for example, t, x plus one, y, and, and w, they're all in the same e equivalence class, right? At least inside the branch. So what we can do, we can pick one of them. Um, we say, for example, that now we do foo of y because y is equal to w, so we don't need to repeat the operation. Okay, this is what GVN does. But now, you know, before we were doing foo of x plus one, now we're doing foo of y. This has an implication, which is branch on poison must be ub, because otherwise, when we were doing this comparison, like, just because t is equal to y doesn't mean that they are the same thing. Right? So one may be poison and the other may be a reasonable value, right? But so if you do, if you give view B when you branch, then you know, it's almost as, it's as if they were the, the same thing, so we are fine. Otherwise, if this is like a non-deterministic jump or something, you are going to get burned. But 
essentially, the, the, the conclusion is this contradicts loop and switching. Okay? So, um, and that's why you cannot have both, because they, they need different semantics. And LVM was doing both, both has, has different semantics. Okay? okay. And now the crying part is that no one listened. Uh, we sent a paper to a uh, uh, quite high compiler developer in some prestigious company. And he replied, oh, paper is such a nice read, but you know, your examples are academic. No one will ever write code like this. Okay. And it was kind of true. I mean, the paper was academic, right? We had examples constructed by hand that could get miscompiled, but we didn't actually have an end-to-end miscompilation um, example. So at this point, you know, what he said was not completely wrong. But it was still funny, uh, because six months later, LVM itself was miscompiled, you know, when compiled with LVM. Right? And the effect was the code of this company start being miscompiled. And this was like an indirect problem, right? Because LVM was miscompiling itself, which then would affect the, the compilation of some other program. Right? It was a very indirect problem. So it was really hard to debug. So there were a couple of developers assigned to these. They spent a lot of time trying to find out what was going wrong. What happened? The LVM developer wrote this. Every transformation above seems of no problem. But the composition re result is wrong. It's still not clear which transformation to blame. Any guesses? Yes, it was exactly what we had in, in the paper. So we knew what was going wrong. We knew how to fix it. Now, going back to that, um, uh, to that developer, he said, no one will ever write such code. Suspense. Of course, he wrote the code. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so it was really funny. So this was an implementation of, of uh, a new analysis in LVM that would get miscompiled you know, with LVM. Um, so, I mean, it was funny. And the bug was fixed, quote, quote, quote by introducing a thing in, in the code, which is, if we are compiling code like this, don't optimize. The, this was the fix at the time, okay? Uh, because people, I mean, actually I signed off this patch, so it's almost my fault. But, you know, at the time we didn't, um, you know, the bug had to be fixed quickly. So this was the, the fix. The warning, because I still want to get grants in the future. You know, um, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I mean, at the time, we actually, we didn't know exactly what, would, what was the extent of the issue, right? We didn't have an end-to-end miscompilation. So we were kind of, you know, we said, we know in theory you can do this. We didn't know in practice you could trigger. Because there are a lot of bugs in LVM that we know they exist, but we don't know how to trigger them end to end, right? So we were, so I think the reaction at that time was reasonable. If you had told me this today, I think that would be unreasonable because now we know a lot more about these kinds of bugs, right? But I think at that time it was um, reasonable from an engineering pr perspective, right? And so we had the solution, which was called freeze, but we had to wait another two years because you need a lot of pain before people will actually fix it for real. Right? So we had quite, um, so we had this big miscompilation in Android. So Android build bots were, were read for a couple of weeks because L LVM was miscompiling Android. And then the Azul Java co compiler was also broken. Okay, so we, we needed you know, more pain before uh, people actually asked us, like, this is all about timing, right? So we're on the sidelines. Then eventually they asked us, okay, can you fix this? Because you said that you know how to fix it, so just fix it. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so my PhD student went and, and he committed the patch. But then it was rolled back because it was, um, it had like a 5% slowdown in some benchmark. And p performance matters, right? So, um, you don't want to explain your manager you, uh, you got a 5% slowdown in some benchmark, which basically means two and a half developers' lifetimes, right? So, um, so essentially what we had to do, we had to first work 
on making sure that performance will not regress right before we could enable the, the fix. Luckily, you know, my PG student was really, really good, and he loved this thing. So he, you know, he fixed it, the performance, the patches went in, um, and it was co released already in LVM 10. Um, and we actually, for some benchmarks, we managed to improve performance because now we could enable more optimizations. Because now we knew um, we could be more aggressive. I mean, we didn't have to be scared of, oh, will this miscompile or not? No, we knew exactly the semantics. Um, so I think it was a cool story. Um, the, the conclusion is, I mean, it's, it's, it's really hard to sell correctness. Like, people like performance. Correctness is like, it's working, why bother? Why am I going to waste a quarter doing something that will not improve the user experience? Right? And it looks expensive. It's not expensive, actually, you know, because it's an uh, investment for the long run, but compiler bugs are really expensive to fix. Like, in, in this particular area, it's just an investment. It's, it's, it's not a cost by any means. Um, but, but the other thing is, it, there's very little research in this area. So even if we want to make LVM correct today, we didn't know how. Okay? This may be surprising, but there are still corners of the semantics that no one knows how to specify and what's the best semantics for the IR there, or even some semantics that is actually consistent. Like some parts of, <laughs> of the compiler we don't know how to make correct today. Okay? So, um, because for many years, compilers were dead or something, I don't know. So there was very little research in this space. So we know, for example, there's a class of optimizations that is wrong um, for LLVM or IR. And these optimizations are there. So, you know, but I don't know how to make them correct right now. Okay. So, um, so just to say that the company's reactions is not totally... Um, weird, right? So we actually, if they were hiring all of us to go there and try to fix the compiler, you know, we didn't know how, or I don't know how. Okay. Um, so there was this a live tool. We um, we realized it was not enough because first it could only verify a very small set, subset of what LVM can do, which is these people optimizations. We forced people to implement the optimizations in a DSL, right? And because we had a promise of we'll give you the C++, right? Um, but the issue is that we never really productized that path, right? So one thing is to do a prototype for the paper. The other is to have a production-ready tool that, you know, developers around the world can use, right? Um, and so adoption was always limited to a subset of people because we would not support a lot of things. So what do you do when a life is not enough? You do a life too. <laughs> so we, see, we switch gears a bit to this translation validation thing. Right? So I'll, we extended what a life could do. So now we, we support all intra-procedural optimizations. So all optimizations that look at one function at a time. So we still don't support optimizations that are global across functions. And the goal is really just to make sure that it adheres to some specification. I don't necessarily care what it is, but we need to make sure that it, it works with one. And then we can improve from there, but it should at least today uh, match some specification. And again, it's fully automatic, and it doesn't require any changes to the workflow, to LVM, whatever. It's, um, it's quite magic. Of course, at some point it will say, I don't know but it will try hard to say something. And the other important thing is that it can identify the optimization that is wrong, right? Because sometimes you have a test case that is miscompiling, but the compiler is like 100 optimizations. You don't know where, where it's wrong, right? So, and Alive will try to pinpoint, okay, is this optimization that is wrong? And by the way, here's a small test case that shows you know, why it's wrong, okay? And this is a super useful tool for, for developers. Okay, so translation validation is a simplification of verification because um, it has one less quantifier. Like tr tr translation validation asks the question, was optimization correct? So you, you compile some program and you check if that particular compilation was correct. 
while verification, you put the quantifier and say, is the optimization correct for all inputs? Right? So tra translation validation is conceptually simpler. And that's why we can also push it further right? and, and make it fully automatic and all, all of the, these things. Right? Because there is no free lunch. Right? So you always need to give, give up on something. So, um, and so translation validation, what we do is like we do a snapshot of the IR before and after the optimization. And then we feed it to the tool, and the tool says, you know, correct, not correct, or I don't know. Right. Um, and so, and then, for example, you can pair these with a fuzzer, which will be your quantifier, and feed with examples right, that are useful for us. Or you can just compile your favorite program and say, oh, is my is the compilation of the program that I care about correct? Because I don't care about the compilation of other people. Um, okay. So the first thing. I mean, the obvious thing to do when you have this tool is, okay, let's run it over the L, over the unit test, right? Because it should be able to at least. False positives. Um, we, by design, we try to err on the other side of, you know, of saying, I don't know. Because, you know, all studies say that people hate false positives, right? So we try to, and LVM has still enough bugs that we can still find bugs by being like this. So I think we are still fine. Maybe next decade, <laughs> when we stop finding bugs, then we may go more on the false positive side. But right now, we just try to say, I don't know, as soon as we don't know anything. Right? Um, okay, so a funny thing is, so we, go, we went to the LVM test suite. We run the tool. And we found more than 100 bugs. And this is crazy, right? Because people write these, these tests to show that the compiler is doing what they think it should be doing, right? And to show that the compiler is correct. But we find more than 100 bugs by just running the small test cases in the test suite. Right? And one thing is, like, the expected result that the tests check against is generated automatically. So if the compiler is wrong, you are going to get the expected wrong result. And of course, developers are supposed to read that thing, but it's very easy to just run the tool and commit, right? Um, and so I've, like, we run a live continuously, and we find, like, copy-paste errors all the time. Right? So people copy the code, and then they generate the expected output automatically, and it's wrong. And, and, right? and you know, a funny story is that it, almost every time we implement, we have the support for a new feature, of LVM in a live, we would find a bug, like, which is, I guess, the axiom of fuzzing as well. Every time you fuzz a program, you find bugs, right? So, and here was exactly the same. Every time we would try to verify something, we would conclude that it was wrong. Um, another important thing is like, you, you also need to verify the verifier, right? And so, by just going over the unit test, it allows us to kind of validate that our semantics was correct, because it was not always correct, right? Like, a live is sometimes also is wrong, because you go to the documentation, you read it, it's very ambiguous. We implement in some way, and then it's actually not the right way. And so there's always um, some dance in trying to fix the documentation, trying to fix a live, and trying to find something that works. Okay. Then, after you run over the unit tests, you know, you start compiling bigger programs, right? And um, we found a lot of scalability issues, both in our tools and C3, because then you start having SMT formulas that are, you know, like 100 gigabytes or something like that. Um, but an interesting thing is also, like, we have some scripts that give us, you know, what's the top 10 features that we don't support. This is very different from what we find in the, in the, in the unit tests, because different people that implement the optimizations will write more tests, like, and so, um, you know, the missing features that we see in the unit tests are not necessarily representative of what C programs look like. Okay. So it, it's useful to find you know, further bugs. Um, and so for Alive2, we also have this, this web interface, so we copied from Compiler Explorer, also known as Godbolt. Uh, like, this is super important. You get permalinks, developers send permalinks to each other. Uh, in the commits, they say, oh, my code is correct because a life says so, they, they, which is sometimes dangerous. Um, um, 
That's why we right here seems to be correct, because I don't want any lawyer at my door. <laughs> um, right. Just a, some funny example. So some guy wanted to uh, optimize this loop into some straight line code. You know? And so he wrote some patch, and then he was like, oh, I, my life says this is correct, neat, nice. Uh, and so like, and he sends the, the link. Um, of course, the patch can still be wrong because you know when he writes a C++, it can still be buggy. But at least there's some intuition that at least the transformation itself is um, is okay. Okay, so now there's no SMT developer here. Okay, it's time to bash on them uh, a little bit. Um, you know, when you write these tools, then you start stress testing and taking SMT solvers to the limit, and so we find also a lot of bugs in Z3. Actually, it happened to us that we proved on optimization correct that was wrong. Like, that was really scary. And we found it because we were cross-checking with CVC4, and then uh, they were giving different results. So, um, so that was a really scary moment to me. So, um, and then we, we also find a lot of scalability issues that we had to fix ourselves, like a timeout mechanism and things like that. Um, Yes, so I think we all write in our papers that we encode into SMT because they improve every year automatically, right? And then we can just reap all the benefits magically, right? So let me maybe uh, say the otherwise. Uh, so this is a plot. I compared Z3 from 2019 to 22. This is like the last release. The bars are time, so lower is better. And so what happened there was we identified and fixed a bug in Z3 with ex some exponential behavior, right? So Z3 improved because we improved it, not because someone is improving it for us. Um, and then over the past year and, and a half, we got an exponential 3% speed up, right? So they increase, like they, SMT solvers improve a lot, right? Um, I have my, my uh, well, oh, this disappeared, but, the, um, this is another set of benchmarks. You see that the time is more or less constant. But more importantly is that Z3 today is finding fewer bugs than it was in 2019. Right? So this is not good, right? So it's kind of a myth that SMT solvers are always improving and, uh, you know, like magically and so on, right? So, um, so this is not good, right? Um, Uh, so, final question for the audience. Um, well, <laughs> no, uh, LVM is not correct yet. So, uh, 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 as I said, even if you want to make it correct, we don't know how. I would say that it's a bit more correct than it used to be. Um, we fix at least some fundamental issues there. Um, we still have some things ongoing. For example, we, we won't get we, like, it's almost my life goal to remove NDEF value from LLVM, which means, for example, we need to change the semantics of the load instruction. Now imagine the amount of work to change the semantics of a fundamental instruction, which is a load, right? So it's not, you know, in engineering-wise, it's not super easy to do this. Um, but eventually, I'd like to go there. And yeah, so as I said, theoretically, there's still some issues. Um, so a cool thing we do, so we track the number of bugs that a life finds in the unit tests over time. And so in the beginning, like in 2020, we were adding support for new features, we were reporting bugs, people were fixing them, so it was kind of stable. Um, and then here, like this big bump, uh, we added some unit tests to expose bugs in the select instruction. So we knew that select was broken, People added a bunch of tests there. Someone fixed an uh, interesting bug. Finally, the select instruction was fixed. So you see this big uh, improvement. Um, Alive also has bugs. So here we fix a bug there. And well, it's still above zero, right? So like, we still find like 100-ish bugs in LVM test suite. Um, Today, right? Uh, but this is good because we can track regressions over time because there, there are all these regressions all the time. Um, okay. 
I'll conclude here. So, like, retrofitting this correct, correctness is really hard because, you know, like, it requires a lot of horror stories. Like, that has always been my experience. Uh, um, Martin was talking about the networks at Microsoft. That was the same. Like, we required data centers to burn, you know, like, everything before you can sell. Oh, here's correctness, right? Um, and, and you need to change culture. Actually, it, it's really impressive that today I got an email from a review in LVM that someone rejected a patch because it would make uh, building tools like a life too harder. And I was like, wow, <laughs> this is like, finally, <laughs> we, we, we got there, right? So, but this took like a decade, right? <laughs> it takes a long time to get there. So, like, if LVM was built from the beginning with a tool that can, you know, at least do some validation, of course, we would be in a much better place. So, so things like MLIR is coming up. Yes. Are they on the right path, or are they going to save platform? <clears throat> That's a timely question. Um, just so MLIR has been hiding under the rug when it comes to undefined behavior, because like no one, all compiler developers or most of them run away from undefined behavior, but it's there, and you need. To handle it. And last week there was finally some proposal to standardize some of it. And the proposal was, oh, let's define it as undefined, quote, quote, but I don't want to define what undefined means, so, you know, let's, let's, let's run while we can. And then, and then I, I wrote a review saying, oh, but why don't we just copy what LVM has? Like, because you don't need to get it right at the first time, but you need at least to define it well such that we know what's correct, what's not, right? So, um, LVM, so MLIR right now, yeah, it's, I'm not sure it's already in the right path, but I hope it will be. And the other complication there is that they have many IRs, right? And they are developed by different groups. And then, which actually makes it even more important that the semantics are very well specified, because when you convert between IRs, you need to make sure that, you know, the semantics are fine. Um, but... The deal is now you have many groups to interact with and to make sure that they know what an defined behavior is, what floating point nans are, and all these crazy things that no one wants to deal with. Um, like, anyway. One other question is, is this a problem with the C, language C that has a lot of undefined behavior that, that gets carried into compilers? No, it's actually one of our papers, we, we have a, Rust, a safe Rust program on the first page uh, that gets miscompiled by LLVM because of undefined behavior. Just to show that you can code whatever you want in Rust. Oh, I feel very safe, but then LLVM is broken, so nothing matters. Um, but the deal is, the safer the language is, the more undefined behavior you can produce for the compiler because undefined behavior, at least my perspective, is just an efficient way of communicating assumptions to the optimizer, right? Because it's, it's like, I don't care about this behavior, so I say it's undefined, right? And safe languages have a lot, like they, can, they have a lot of information. Like these, just saying this pointer arithmetic will not overflow, for example. Like all safe languages can say this. Or I will not access memory out of bounds. So they give a lot of uh, information for the optimizers and they need to be able to exploit these. Right? So, um, so I think the problems will only get worse because we are going in a path of safer languages. So I think the problem will get worse actually. Um, Um, yeah, so correctness never ends, right? Um, like, we catch regressions all the time, right? So you, like, it's a never-ending job, right? Um, and it's really important to have really easy-to-use tools. Like, it's sometimes we, researchers, we want the best tool that verifies everything, whatever, but it doesn't matter, right? So what matters is developers can, whether the developers can use it, right? So it's better to sacrifice on fanciness or, you know, the amount of crazy things it can do, but just give a tool that people can use. Or, I mean, at least that's, like, that's my philosophy. Um, the other super important thing for students to take away is verifying a, stu a real system requires fixing it first. Like, anyone that says, I verify a system or I specify the system, and they didn't find any bug or they didn't fix anything, they have uh, assumed false somewhere, right? Because... Uh, all real things are broken, 
right? So we could have, like, if LLVM was correct, I would be done many years ago, right? So, like, I will, I'm not done because we still don't know <laughs> what correct compiler means, right? Um, yeah, so, I mean, we have been trying to improve correctness. Um, we are not there, but I think we, we are a lot better than we used to be. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any remaining questions? Yeah. Uh -huh. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for your talk and also for your work. As a software engineer who runs LLVM a thousand times a day, it really makes me sleep better at night that uh, such work is done. Now, I have actually two questions, uh, more a high-level one. Uh, so you mentioned it's very difficult to change uh, culture and convince people that this is actually worth doing. I was wondering, uh, did you ever try to, in a case study or so, put the uh, dollar number, like this is how many billion dollars was lost, you know, with people trying to beep off things when they see a Windows blue screen or something, or a data center was burning down, versus, uh, you know, the, the time a PhD student, for example, invested into making this possible. Yeah, um, I must confess I'm really bad in marketing, so uh, <laughs> I, I, I never tried to do that, but, um, but definitely, I mean, it pays off for sure. So um, we did that study in Microsoft for the network verification because we had a manager. We they asked us to, to do this, and you know the the number. I mean, the difference of investment versus what you would save was uh, was several orders of magnitude of difference in million dollars. Right? So it's it's like verification in this kind of things. It pays off, right? and and like. Really, just debugging one blue screen of Windows pays off whatever many <laughs> PhD students or whatever. Right? So, uh, and and also security-wise, right? Because if you if you the compiler removes a bound check, right, and then you get hacked, you know, that's just that incident pays off verification, or, like pays off the the whole project, essentially. Um, but yeah, but we didn't do that study. I, I, I think at some point. So I've just become a professor this year, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to learn how to write grants. I think that's a, a skill I need to. <laughs> to well, it certainly up. really pays off, but it might be interesting to see these right. dollar numbers for also people outside, uh, you know, like the community. Uh, now, a second question, which is more, um, let's say, um, so at what point would you trust nuclear power plants running control software compiled with LLVM, if ever? Yeah, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm really scared. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, that answers the question. <laughs> and actually, I know a company that writes software for nuclear power plants. And, um, and once I spoke with them and asked them, oh, do you do any verification? And they said, what? That, <laughs> that's a huge cost. We, we follow the ISO standard XXX, and, and they don't say anything about verification, so we don't do it, right? So we... So, um, so, so broken code is already out there and in planes as well, so who knows what's running there. Um, but at that point, uh, yeah, so I just ignore and try to sleep. But um, because the truth is, it's not that common to see miscompiled code getting called. Like, I know that a lot of programs that we use are getting miscompiled today. I know, but we don't see the effects of that, right? So, um, because some of miscompilations we find is, oh, this is wrong for when it's called with int mean and, and something, right? So it's sometimes it's if for some corner case, right? But sometimes it actually happens. I mean, that example with LLVM miscompiling some internal code was really funny, right? But um, I think in practice, it's not super common. But I think we are missing that study on can we actually be adver adversarial and exploit the things for profit. So I've been wanting to hire a student to work on that um, because I think these bugs can be uh, exploited. So I have a little bit of a contrarian view, so take it with a grain of salt. Uh, every field of engineering had to kill a few thousand people before they realized there are issues in there. Uh, bridges, chemistry, stuff like 
giving people uh, 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 so all these things had happened the interesting thing that uh, that really uh, like uh, crazy thing is even though com programming is so ubiquitous today we can't point to anything that programming has killed more than two or three people uh, things like uh, uh, even the examples we use are all these uh, uh, um, uh, uh, cancer treating machines that didn't shut off on time. But given the ubiquity of the com computers, that seemed to be a really good place. So in some sense, you can make argument, we don't need to do this. <laughs> so take it with a grain of salt. I, I tend to agree. So And, and that's why, you know, I don't focus just on let's getting fully correct by getting fully correct, right? And so the work has been, okay, let's get, try to be correct, but performance also matters. And by the way, let's give tools that actually help the developer's workflow, which is, a, oh, let me pinpoint the bug when they are developing optimizations, right? So I think it has to be more than just let's get fully correct because, as you say, I mean, no one cares, uh, I guess. Um, but I guess no one cares as long as it's not them. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, yes. All right. Shandong. Oh, man. It's like. <laughs> Do the exercise. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, thanks a lot. I think um, it's great work that you folks have done uh, from live to a live two and for ten, for 10 years. And uh, I think uh, this is really the first time that people have made translation validation practical, right? And uh, Amir Noeli came up with the idea from the 19, maybe the 80s also, right? 40 years later, somebody made this practical, that's great. Now the question is, uh, so suppose you couple this with super optimization, mm -hmm. would that be able to allow us to construct uh, correct uh, transformations, at least at the people level? Um, actually, one of the bugs we, find with, we found it with Z3 was when um, we were doing super optimization. Okay. And that was the scary part, is that now you are blindly trust, trusting in these tools to generate optimizers that humans are not reviewing. So now you really need to trust the SMT solver and the live and et cetera. Mm -hmm. So uh, you need to have a lot more trust uh, because our current mode is there's a human and there's a tool. So it goes at least to true things. Um, so if you remove one of the equation, I think we need uh, SMT solvers that produce, for example, proofs. Because SMT solvers are also really complicated magic tools, right? And they, they, they're also super easy to get wrong. So I don't trust SMT solvers either. So until they start producing proofs, uh, I think I would not want my code to be blindly optimized with, okay. based on the SMT solver. I see. Then maybe a follow-up from that is you, you have a slide that shows over the years, these three, uh, the latest these three somehow reduced the number of bugs that you can find by 16%, right? Could you speculate on what might be the causes for that? What happened within these three? I, well, part of it is your fault, right? So. <laughs> I mean, not your fault, but I mean, um, like fixing bugs in Z3 um, I mean, um, had a toll, right? Because when you make things co correct, you may impact performance, right? Um, but so the quantifier instantiation algorithm of Z3 is not, I mean, it's, it's not uh, very robust, right? So sometimes small changes in the formula. Actually, sometimes you think you are making the formula better but now the quantifier instantiation won't kick in, right? So, and so, so yeah, this is my long-term fight with, with, with Z3 is like, I would like to have something that we can customize from outside, you know, because we know more or less what, how quantifiers can be instantiate, instantiated for our domain, but then Z3 doesn't know. So, um, so I think, yeah, so anyway, so the, these algorithms in SMT solvers, some of them are not super robust. So you change the formula slightly, and then you are off. So um, some optimizations are good locally, but then globally they are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks for the talk. I have a question regarding IRs. So there was this slide where, with all these trade-offs that 
one needs to balance when designing an IR. And nowadays we have things like MLIR, so we give up and we say, yeah, we have a domain-specific IR for each problem, but we still need one general purpose a thing that the, the low-level part of the compiler operates on. And the question is, what did we learn in the, those 10 years? Or how does one navigate this space if one wants to design a new IR that is better than what we have? Right. I mean, MLIR did not give up. So they push the complexity from um, building optimizations to building translations within IRs. Right? So they make optimizations really easy and simple, but then the translation between IRs may be um, NP-hard or maybe, you know, and, and decidable. Um, so it's a different architecture, different perspective uh, on this role. Um, I think there's no good question, I mean, there's no good answer for your question. So I think there's very little um, um, research on IR. So like, for example, there was, uh, SSA is from the 90s. Then there was a master student at MIT that came up with SSI. I'm not sure he even knew what he was doing uh, because the SSI was not built for what it's used today. So it was built for something else, then people adapted. And then after SSI, there was memory SSA, for example, which was invented by industry. So we academics, we should be ashamed that <laughs> industry is actually leading you know, developments in that area. Uh, but memory SSA is not the answer because it doesn't know how to handle concurrency or whatever, right? So. Um, there's actually no one doing research on IRs right now, or in the past, I don't know, so many years. So um, people do, well, okay, not super accurate. P people try to develop IRs for specialized things, right? Um, for example, the polyhedra compiler guys, they have that, uh, I'll put in that category, but you know, more general purpose IRs, there's really no one. Because that kind of research is super expensive, right? Like you cannot build a compiler from scratch in a, in, in a university, it's impossible. And changing an IR of a compiler is also very expensive. So, and you didn't have tools before. I think Alive now gives you that ability is that if you want to change the semantics of the IR, you can, run a, you can implement that in Alive and you can test what happens to the optimizers. Like is this, because otherwise you don't know what's the impact. Like you do a change of, in an IR, is this optimization still correct or not? Like, are you going to go through 100 optimizations by hand and prove co correctness? Right? So I think before it was a lot harder than now to do this kind of experimentation. But still, I, there's no good answer for that. Like, I mean, like it, it, it's open to grabs for research, I think. Thank you. So one thing interesting is a lot of these IRs are very old. They have designed in a time where uh, storage was really at premium, so there's a lot of compaction, stuff like that. So it might be interesting to see. I think uh, we have been thinking a little bit about IRs and, 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 and modernizing IRs. Mainly f our angle has been to make it easy to transform because a lot of IRs, like things like trees, modifying trees is very hard uh, in there. But I think there might be interesting part to say make, make IRs that is also easy to verify. So it might be interesting to see whether there's a new set of principles, both uh, make it easy to transform, more, make it easy to analyze, and make it easy to verify. And also a better way to write uh, a transformation because just tree rewriting rules type thing is, is, is a mess. It's, uh, I mean, you have a bunch of these rules. There's no good cost model. So cost model, so it does a lot of bad things all over the place. So it, it's probably good, ripe time to basically completely redo uh, how a compiler is built. I agree. Um, and, so, and one thing, for example, current compiler IRs are really bad for current CPUs because they were built in another era. And now performance comes from caching. And... The current IRs, it's a lot of punter chasing, like a lot of cache misses. Like for performance wise, the current IRs are really bad. Right. So th there are a lot of opportunities for sure. Um, yeah, so, um, but I think there are not enough people working on this thing because it's a really complex problem. The investment is really large to do any proof of concept in this area. You know, there's a sizable investment. Um, Thanks for the talk. I had one question. 
when Alive says your optimization is not correct, what kind of feedback do you give to the developer so that the developer can easily figure out why it was not correct? Or do you have any research on this to use counterexamples from the SMT solvers and so on? Yeah, so that's important. And um, we, sp we didn't do any paper on that, but we did a lot of, we talk a lot with developers. And, and actually, different communities have different um, perspectives on that. For example, I worked with the Visual Studio compiler guys, and they had a different perspective than, say, LVM guys. And because LVM uses IR as text for input outputs, for example, Visual Studio compiler, they are used to C. Um, the other funny thing is, for example, people don't like to read huge constants. Like, if you give a country example with even 32-bit integers that are super complicated, you know, like it seems like a random pattern, people will freak out because it's not easy to read the number and realize, oh, this is just a power of two minus one or power of two times, uh, I don't know, something. So we try something simple is just to reduce the bit width of integers because it's much easier to understand what's going on. And also we try to get rid of undefined behavior. Like if the optimization is wrong when the corner cases are not hit. Of course, it's much easier to realize what's going on, right? So, um, like, we try to do this, these simple things, but it's definitely something that we pay a lot of attention, we invest a lot of time, because it's not easy to give good counterexamples. Like, because the SMT solver will give you some model, right? But then going from that model into something readable, uh, it's not always simple. Um, but we never did any formal study or something. We just go on a conference and people complain and then <laughs> we fix. Uh, I think that's, that's how it works. Um. All right, no more questions, I guess. All right, lots of questions, that's great. So let's thank uh, Nuno again for the talk.